Awesome. What's up, everybody? I feel like there's like this different energy. How many are finished with finals? Oh, no. So, no. Wrong energy, right? I guess because my husband, right, he comes home, he's like, I'm so excited. I'm like, why? He's like, I taught my last class. It's, it's over. And he's just like super giddy and just like just super silly lately. And I was like, bro, you, you just need to calm down a little bit. I know you're excited, but just calm down. Get to that dissertation and get that finished first, okay? Okay. Um, well, my name is Alicia Horton, and uh, I am on staff here at the Grove Church. I am the assistant director of women's ministry. Um, I get to serve with my road dog, Jenny Price. What, what? Yes, and um, been here less than a year, so fairly, fairly new, but I can say this with full confidence, it's been a blessing. My family and I have transitioned from Long Beach, um, where we were there church planning, and um, it's just a breath of fresh air to be amongst uh, like-minded people and people that love God, and so it's, it's been a blessing to say the least. Um, Jacob kind of gave it away, but my boo thing, my BFF is Professor D.A. Horton to some of you, right? Um, that's my baby daddy, so, so I know him as Damon Anthony Horton, senior. And so um, we've been together, gosh, ugh, I don't want to give my age away, but a uh, little over 20 years. We've been married. It will be 18 years this coming June. We have three kids. Thank you. I appreciate that. We have three kids, uh, 17 12 and 7, two girls and one boy. And so um, God has been good to us um, in that. And so um, probably you're like trying to figure out my age. You're like, hmm, I thought you were 12. Yes, no, it's okay. Um, but the thing that I want to talk about to you guys tonight and challenge you with is um, from a message from John chapter 10. Emily did a phenomenal job last week bringing the word in John chapter 9 and helping us to understand what it means to be spiritually blind. And so I kind of want to keep that same, uh, that same vibe and keep going and unpacking this John uh, chapter 10. So if you can make sure your Bibles are open to John chapter 10. The title of my message is Binds My Wandering Heart to Thee. Um, before I get into it, I kind of want to give a disclaimer. See, this text shows the distinction between the good shepherd and those who are enemies of the sheep. And this text is often used to bring this distinction between Jesus, who can rightfully claim to be the good shepherd, and those who are the false prophets that intend to lead the sheep astray. And in this context, you see Jesus got done healing the man born blind, right? And of course, the Jews who are chilling on the sidelines questioning him, saying, how dare you? How can you heal First of all, on the Sabbath, who gives you this authority and how, who are you, right? They're over there just secretly and openly hating on Jesus, trying to figure out who is this man. And so remember, many of those so-called teachers of the law did not even believe that Jesus was the promised Messiah. They had heard about him, they had read about him, they had studied about him, but they could not believe that this humble human being who was God in the flesh is now here to set up his kingdom, but they were ready to, for somebody to come and overthrow the Roman kingdom, right? They were, they were feeling oppressed and they didn't, it didn't fit the mold that they had it pictured for Jesus. And so um, they were more concerned about their politics, their, their policy, their religion, and they missed the fact that, again, God in the flesh right in front of their faces. And so he gives them this mic drop of a response that we see in the last two verses of chapter 9. So if you could turn with me to John chapter 9, we're going to look at the first uh, or the last two verses there. It says, some of the Pharisees near him heard these things and said to him, are we also blind? Jesus said to them, if you were blind, you would have no guilt. But now that you say we see, your guilt remains. And the thing to point out here is that they were guilty of not believing in Christ. So this, this disbelief that they had, Jesus in the flesh, God in the flesh, they see these miracles, they hear these teachings, but they still did not believe. Um, they were content. They were content in being blinded from the truth because they were so comfortable in their sin that it made it difficult to see Jesus. Is that true in our lives today? Is it difficult to see Jesus because we are blinded? by our sin, and we don't see the truth that God keeps putting right in front of us. So we're going to keep unpacking that thought. And so I want us to look at John chapter 10 and these 18 verses because we're going to see how Jesus warns his followers about these false teachers. He calls them wolves. He calls them strangers. He talks about a hired hand. 
And he wants us to understand how to hear the voice of God more clearly and how to distinguish between false teachings and God's truth. And so um, some questions I want us to consider are these. What does it mean to know the voice of God? Why did Jesus consider himself to be a good shepherd? What does that actually mean? Why does God often refer to us believers, followers of Christ, as sheep? There's a distinction there. There's a reason. What makes us prone to wander? And more importantly, how can we stay connected to God and hear his voice more clearly? So I'm going to read beginning in verse 1 in John chapter 10, coming from the ESV. It says, truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door but climbs in by another way, that man is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the gatekeeper opens. The sheep hear his voice and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all of his own, he goes before them and the sheep follow him for they know his voice. A stranger they will not follow but they will flee from him for they do not know the voice of strangers. This figure of speech Jesus used with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. Verse 7. So Jesus again said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and we will go in and out and find pasture. Okay, not go to in and out, but go in and out and find pasture. Uh, verse 10, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy, but I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Verse 11, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd who does not own the sheep sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep, but I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me, just as the Father knows me and I know the Father. And I lay down my life for my sheep and have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also and they will listen to my voice so there will be one flock, one shepherd. For this reason the Father loves me because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down in my own accord. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my Father. The last three verses I want to kind of give a nod to because I feel like they are more better suited for the next passage of chapter 10. Because here they are, Jesus says these bomb troops, he's dropping bomb troops on them, and they're like, wait a minute. So you're basically saying that you have the power of God, Right? That's, that's tripping them out. And now you're saying in the second passage that you guys will probably unpack in the coming weeks, you're saying that you and the Father are one. That totally disrupted their thoughts. And so I want to save that and give a nod to who's going to be able to teach that next week. But it's very fitting because they're thinking he's demon-possessed. They're calling him crazy, a lunatic. They do not believe that this is God in the flesh. And so um, I want to pray. Lord, we just come before you. We're thankful. We're so thankful for your written word that we have today. Lord, I pray, Father God, that you would just use this word to make yourself known to us. May we hear and know your voice more clearly than ever before. Uh, use these words to penetrate the hearts of the listeners. All these things we ask in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay. So have you ever, ever, ever done something that you shouldn't have done? Okay. They came back to you almost the same way that you dished it out, right? Some people like to call that karma. I, I personally don't believe in that. I feel like there's a biblical principle here that we can apply to this. It's called reaping what you sow, right? I feel like that sounds a little bit more spiritual, right? Um, so for me, I used to do this thing as a kid, okay? So me and my brother, so there's girl, boy, boy, girl. So I'm the youngest of the four. Um, and me and my brother, five years apart, whenever we went to the store with my mom, we knew, okay, if mom's going there and it's not just to grab recipe, you know, things for the recipe that she was cooking that night, it's going to be a long time. And so we're trying to figure out, because first, before we got out of the car, she was like, don't look at nothing, don't touch nothing, don't ask for nothing, you ain't going to get nothing. So we're like, dang, like, so we're like, how are we going to keep ourselves entertained, right? So we felt like, well, we're going to play tag and we're going to play hide and seek. And guess what? There are some great spots in the store, right? The main spot that we used to hide in, the clothing rack, right? Clothing rack. It's like a world 
of its own. You go in there, you could probably set up shop and have a picnic in there. Nobody would know. Literally, it's, 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 it's crazy. Try it. Or you could read a book, whatever you want to do. Um, but for us, that's what we did. And we would go in there and we would hide, right? And that literally would cause great terror and horror in my mother's heart as she was looking for us. And we knew that if she were to use these three words, our first, middle, and last name, we were in big trouble, right? Big trouble. And so, but it was fun for us, right? And so as a parent, guess what? They came back to bite me, right? My, my, my two youngest daughters, when they were little, um, my oldest daughter, she was a little bit more fearful. And she tried to pull that on me one time. I was like, mm, been there, done that. You can try. So instead of acting fearful, because I, I could see her little hair sticking up and the, there was not that many clothes in the clothing rack because she was just sitting there giggling. I was like, okay, I'm going to walk away. Bye. I'll see you later. And she just darts out, mom, no, don't leave me, don't leave me. Like she was so scared. But the middle child, oh my goodness, she was, the, she was, I would say was, the epitome of the middle child syndrome. Like literally, push the envelope. Many of you got some middle child are shaking your head. I see somebody. Push the envelope, lived on the edge, like scared the mess out of us all the time, literally. And so for her, she didn't catch me off guard. She caught her daddy off guard. So one day they were in the store, and she was like, okay, I'm going to go and hide. And her sister wasn't with her, so it was just her by herself. And she was like, I'm going to go hide. And my husband about lost his mind. He was not ready for that. He's literally frantic, running up and down the aisles. I wish I could, like, go back and see that security camera footage because literally that would have been super funny. He's running down the aisles looking for her, calling out her name like, lo, 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 freaking out. And funny thing is, he, he turns the corner as he's calling out for Lola. Here comes this kid running going, daddy, daddy. He's like, skirt, like, hold on. Let me swerve and go this way because you ain't my child. I know my child. I know what she looks like. I know what she sounds like. She knows what I look like. You ain't my child. And if I take you back, to my wife, we're going to have some problems, right? Because you, I am not your daddy. I'm not your daddy. And so she, and then after he turns the corner, um, here comes Lola running out. And he's just like flipping out. Like, oh my gosh, I can't believe you did this. And she's giggling. Like a middle child, just think it was the funniest thing in the world, right? And it, in that, I'm just thinking, gosh, like there, there's something to be said of that, Right? The story was real, right? And I kind of embellished it a little bit, but here's the thing I want you to understand. There is authentic security that exists in that relationship, right? There's a bond that exists between us and our children because they know us and we know them. There's a desire to protect them, to make sure that they are safe by any means, at all costs. We would be willing to do that for them because they are our children. And in addition to that, there is a genuine love and care for their well-being. So not just we're not care, concerned about their physical so, uh, safety and their well-being, but their mental health, their emotional health, their spiritual health, all of that. All of that makes them a whole person. And in addition to that, we know each other's voices and they know ours. And so this relationship, imagine with me, is a picture of just how Jesus cares for his sheep. He cares for each of us just like that, but guess what? He does it perfectly. He never loses us. Which is why we need to understand the difference between those who are for us and those who are against us. And what you will find every time that Jesus is always for us. Unless we got sins going on in here we haven't confessed, he's always going to be for us. And so the thing I want us to unpack here is this. Jesus, the shepherd of authentic security. We're going to look at the first six verses of John chapter 10. Looking at the first verse, it says, Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door but climbs in another way, that man is a thief and a robber. But he who enters the door by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the gatekeeper opens. So we see the distinction here between these two groups. Jesus claiming to be the good shepherd and these false teachers. Again, same false teachers that were chilling in the cut, listening as he was telling these parables and doing his miracles. And so there's two distinctions here that he shows that how you can tell the difference between them. One is climbing up the wall, and the other one is entering by the door. And because, again, we see this flow directly from chapter 9, which we talked about earlier, he's, again, wanting to make it very, very, very clear that Jesus is a good shepherd because he has been appointed by God. So here's some distinctions. Those who climb the wall are robbers and thieves. And guess what? Their intent is to bring harm. If you think about this, people who go through the back door, they ain't up to no good, right? 
Those who go through the front door, they're welcomed because they are known, right? Secondly, the gatekeeper opens the door to the shepherd. And Jesus, again, appointed by God, has access to the fold, so he gets that access into that door. But those who have to climb the wall, they're self-appointed and self-righteous. Another distinction here he's trying to point out is that there is a following versus a fleeing. In the, the second part of chapter 3, verses, or, uh, verse 3, verse through 5, the sheep hear his voice and he calls his own sheep by name. And he leads them out. When he has brought out all of his own, he goes before them. And the sheep follow him for they know his voice. A stranger, they will not follow, but they will flee from him. For they do not the, know the voice of strangers. And so, again, there are some similarities. That's why it's so important for us to know the voice of God. We have to be ones that are marked by understanding how to discern the voice of God. Because there will be deceit there. There will be people that will come in our lives and it's like, ooh, that kind of sounds good, that looks good, but is it really good? And we have to be ones to understand how to discern that. So some similarities that are here are, the, are four things. They desire to be near the sheep. Both the false prophets and Jesus desire to be near the sheep. They desire to lead the sheep. They desire to talk to the sheep and converse with the sheep. And lastly, they desire to be followed. But here are some differences that I want us to point out. The shepherd knows his sheep and, the, and he knows them by name. The stranger does not know them intimately. The sheep know the voice of the shepherd, but they do not know the voice of the stranger. The shepherd desires, again, to care for the sheep. And the stranger, that thief, desires to take from the sheep. The, the shepherd desires to protect the sheep and to keep them close while the hired hand, as we see later on, leaves them when they see a wolf coming. That's, that's kind of that's sketch there, right? You're going to hire him, but you're going to leave when you see the wolf coming? That's just, oof. And the robber climbs the wall to get to the sheep, but the shepherd uses the door because guess what? He is the door. We're going to unpack that. In one of the commentaries that I was reading through, it, it, it kind of gets confusing to us as contemporary readers because we're like, we see all these roles, we hear this hired hand, this wolves, and it's, we don't want to get tripped up on the symbolism of that. But we want to understand the intentions of each role because each party had an intent with the sheep. And here's what I want us to understand in this passage. Jesus represents authentic security for his people. Whereas those who are not aligned with Jesus are set against the well-being of the sheep. So here's a note for us to write down. Jesus is the model of authentic security. So let me ask you this. What are you turning to for comfort and protection that is not God or that is not of God? What are you finding false security in? What is God asking you to let go in order for you to grow and to trust him more that you keep holding on to? Is it education? Is it the program that you're currently in at school? Is it that job? Is it that boyfriend, that girlfriend? Is it a hobby, group friends, sport? What is it? Because what I'm not saying is that any of these things can be inherently wrong, right? But I want to encourage you to, to do this, to be a generation that is marked by understanding, again, like I said, how to discern the voice of God. Because you would understand the voice of God so clearly that you'll be able to remove those things out of your life before God has to remove them out of your life. Amen. If you understand the voice of God that way, you would be able to discern and walk in wisdom, understanding, ooh, what do I need to let go of? And really allow God to move in my life in this way. That's radical living. But are you ready for that? Are you? And so what I want us to understand is this, discerning the differences between the voice of God, the voice of the enemy, the voice of the world, and the voice of even our own flesh. You see, there was a time where my children had to use quick discernment in a situation that could have honestly ended up all bad. I'll keep a long story short. But we were in Walmart, and we were looking at workout equipment. And at that time, I just, it was my two daughters and my, my husband and I. We were at one end of the aisle. They were at the other end. And I remember they were in close proximity, so we were like, okay, they're good. You know, we're nearby. But we didn't see that there was a, a predator lurking on the sidelines, beckoning them to come towards him. And in that situation, I was just like, I saw my girls kind of like looking, looking confused. But immediately, my children knew that he was a stranger. They knew because we had taught them how to understand stranger danger, right? Therefore, they did not follow him. 
he did not have their best interest at heart. And he seemed to want to harm them and not protect them. He did not represent authentic security. Therefore, they fled and they came towards us. And lastly, if I could be quite honest, they messed with the wrong mama bear. Because I was like, y'all know, I'm, y'all don't know I'm from the inner city. I'm like, y'all have to catch these hands. I'm going to make sure I protect your, my kids, your kids, whoever else's kids. You messed with the wrong person. Seriously, I followed that man and made sure that the police got called. It could have ended up all bad. But I look at that and I'm like thinking, thank you, Lord, for giving us the opportunity to help our kids to learn, to discern the voice of strangers. What's authentic and what is not. What is harmful, what is helpful. And so as we move into verses 7 through 13, here Jesus makes another claim. He talks about himself being not only the shepherd, but now he is the gate of salvation. Um, Let's read. It says, so Jesus again said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. Jesus establishes here that he is the door, meaning he is the way of salvation. And he is the only way, only way to the Father. This I am statement, you're going to unpack this as you're going through this gospel. Because there's so many I am statements that Jesus makes here. Because he can rightfully claim that he is that dude, right? And we'll see this because this passage correlates with John chapter 14 verses 6 where he says, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life, and no one can come to the Father except through me. Y'all, this is countercultural living. Jesus claimed it to be the only way to the Father was so disruptive to what they had believed because many teachers of the law who were self-appointed, okay, the ones who were self-righteous, felt that their good works, their ethnic identity, being Jewish, them practicing the law, them reading the law, them studying the law, they thought that was the way. That was the way to be into the, in the kingdom of God. But Jesus flipped the script on him and said, no, 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 no. I am the way. I am the truth and I am the life. And so not only was that counterculture back in those times, but this truth is also counterculture and contrary to popular beliefs today, y'all. There are so many outside influences that are telling us There are many paths to God. You know, let's find what Jesus feels comfortable to you and you serve that Jesus. No, 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 no. Jesus made an exclusive claim to said, I am the only way to God the Father. Our good deeds, our faithful attendance, coming to Grove Young Adults every week, uh, volunteerism, Christian playlists, None of that, none of it earns us a seat into the kingdom of God. It's when we confess our sinfulness to God, knowing good and well we cannot save ourselves. Accepting by faith through grace alone that what Jesus did on our behalf of us sinners was good enough. And believing that Jesus is the only way, that is the way. In verse 9, he says, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved. So another note to write is this. Jesus is the model of authentic salvation. You see, verses 8 through 14, he again, he talks about these group of people, the thieves, the robbers, the hired hands. Jesus once again reemphasizes the difference between himself being the good shepherd versus those groups. And here's some more distinctions. They have no real ownership of the sheep. Their intentions are wrong. They're evil. They're, he said they came to kill, steal, and destroy. They desire to deceive and mislead. But here's the difference. Jesus loves his sheep. So much that he laid his life down. And so when we read these distinctions between the two parties, my concerns as it relates to where you are at is what voice or voices are you following? Are you allowing to speak to you? It may not necessarily be like a false prophet, but what about the false thinking, the false ideas, the false beliefs? What have you allowed in your life that has deceived you? How are you staying connected to God when the world, the enemy of your soul, and your flesh comes at you, barraging your mind with all these lies? How are you combating that? Are you walking in God's truth or are you just saying, you know what, let me, let me read a verse today to keep the devil away. And that's it. I'm good with that. Or are you taking time to spend, to be in the presence with God the Father so he knows you and you know him? Where is that? What have you allowed in your life that could potentially destroy your Christian character witness? What is robbing you of your joy? 
You see, Nehemiah 8.10 says this, do not be grieved for the joy of the Lord is your strength. Psalms 27, 1 through 3 says, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear and whom shall I be afraid? When evil doers assail me to eat up my flesh, my adversaries and my foes, check this out. It is they who stumble and fall, not I. Because Jesus is there with me fighting my battles and helps me to have the strength to endure. So it is they who stumble and fall. So Jesus is not not only our eternal and spiritual salvation, but when we daily run to him, he provides us either salvation from our trouble or the strength to keep enduring that trial. As we look at the latter uh, part of this passage in verses 14 through 18, Jesus again makes the claim as being the good shepherd. Why did Jesus make that claim Is he qualified? Yes, 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 and amen. He is the definition of love and everything good. 1 John 4, 7 through 8 tells us, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. And whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. Luke 18, 19 says, And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. But here's the, here's the kicker. Again, as you were reading the next passage, Jesus and the Father are one. They are equal in power and authority. They share everything equally. And I love this. In this passage, in these four verses, he says four different times that he lays down his life willingly for his sheep. How good does that feel, right? When someone steps up in our place and does something for us that we can't do or we're unable to do. How do we feel when they sacrifice for us, right? It makes us feel good. Or it gives up something for the sake of our good while they suffer. So when my husband and I got together, there were things that were very uniquely different about us, right? One of us liked to wear triple size clothing, okay, like everything baggy, everything was baggy. Another one of us liked to wear everything that was fitted. One of us liked to spend every last dollar of our check, while the other one liked to save every last dollar of their check. One of us had a checking account and a savings account with money, and the other one had a checking account with a bunch of negative numbers in it. Okay? I won't say who's the two, but maybe you can figure that out. It just wasn't me. Just saying. (laughs) So when we got married, let's just say we had a lot of friendly disagreements, right? We like to call them friendly disagreements. Sounds a little bit better, right? Um, because when we got into our marriage, he came with debt. And I was like, yo, how, how did we do this? Like, you, yes, I just didn't understand. How did you do this? And there was a phone bill that he had racked up um, that was $1,200. Yes. And I'm like, who were you talking to? Who are you texting? Oh, wait, that's me. Yeah, you were, you're texting and talking to me. Okay, my bad. Um, but he had racked up all that. Because back in the day, y'all, like, it cost, like, $10 to send a text, like, for real. Like, back in the day, there was not that plan where everything came with it. It was so expensive. And so that bill was so great. And here we were, a month after we got married, we found out we were pregnant. That was a, that was a, a souvenir from our honeymoon. Found out we were pregnant. Just saying. And his mom was so gracious. She was like, hey, like, um, you, we, we have a bill. Because his, his phone line was in his parents' name. And so it was like, we have a bill. I've been really, like, just nervous to bring this to you. But I really do, we don't want this looming over our head. And we understood. We said, no, we're going to be responsible adults and take care of this. I was livid, to say the least. Because I was like, this was in your name. Okay, whatever. What's mine is yours. What's yours is mine. Okay, we're going to do this. And so I write out a check for $700. I said, listen, we're going to pay this part, but we're going to have to make, like, payments. Like, is there, like, a layaway plan? Is how, how are we going to work this out? Because this, I can't take care of all the 1200 right? How my bank account is set up, it just ain't going to work like that, right? And so we... We were, they were so gracious. And so when my husband went over there, took the check to his dad, gave it to him in his hand, and he took the check, looked at him, and ripped it up. And we were like, wait, what? Like, I, I spent a lot of time writing that 700 in your name. Like, what, what just happened here? Um, but his dad, they knew. They knew. They knew we were stressed because we just found out we were pregnant. They didn't want to bring all that added stress into a new marriage. And they said, it's okay. We got it. We'll take care of the bill. And guess what, y'all? They paid it in full. Talk about grace, talk about just compassion and love and all the characteristics that we can name about God. That was what happened, y'all. Y'all, we have a good shepherd. 
that willingly laid down his life for us. He knew we could never pay our sin debt that we owed, that we racked up. He knew our good works and our righteousness, it was is worthless. It can never compare to what he could do for us. So because of his love for us, he sent his only son, Jesus, to die a death that each of us deserve. He gave up his life for the sake of our own good. That's why he's a good shepherd, y'all. He is so good. Here's a last note for you to take. Jesus is the model of authentic love and goodness. We can only genuinely, genuinely love others because guess what? As 1 John 4, 19 says it, tells us, because he first loved us. Like I said in the beginning, for those who are in Christ, Jesus is always for us. Romans 8.28 tells us he works things out for our good and his glory. So why do we keep chasing after things that deplete us and defeat us? Why? Because we are just like sheep. It is so fitting in this narrative that Jesus refers to people as sheep. It's fitting for several reasons and I want to share. Because... In these verses, not only in these verses he talks about us as sheep, but in all of the Bible he talks about us as sheep. Hebrews 13, 20 says, Now may the God of peace who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep by the blood of the eternal covenant. Psalm 78, 52, then he led out his people like sheep and guided them in the wilderness like a flock. Psalms 95, 7 says, For he is our God and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 25 says, For you were straying like sheep, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. So I think it's so, so interesting and noteworthy that he uses this word sheep in this passage, in these 18 verses, 12 times. He refers to people as sheep because we have sheep-like behaviors. So let me just give some to you. By nature, sheep are followers. Sheep react to their surrounding and their reactions are pretty predictable. Sheep resist moving from one surface to another. They have no depth perception. So shadows, dark surfaces, and water, that's all bad for them. They fear new visual objects. They are gullible, they are timid, and they have no real means of self-defense. They can easily be flipped over. Easily be flipped over. Don't go trying it now. They can easily be flipped over, especially when they have too much wool. And so the shepherd has to flip them back over. But here's the cool thing. They have a more developed sense of sound. And they depend heavily on that. So when when the shepherd is feeding and caring for them, it's important for him to speak calmly and reassuring to keep gaining their trust. Here's the dopest one I thought. It just blew my mind. I literally was like, oh, my gosh. Their eyes are positioned on the sides of their head, y'all. While ours are positioned right here in the front, okay? So even though they have a narrow binocular vision, check this out. When their head is down and they are grazing, the sheep can see from all sides. It's crazy. So our head's down, we can't see from all sides. But when their head is down and they are grazing, they can, sheep, they can see from all sides. And they can see predators more clearly. So when their heads are in these downward positions, they're the safest. Y'all, when we keep our heads down into the green pasture that God provides for us in his written word, we can see predators more clearly. We can hear his voice more clearly because we're doing exactly what he has, wants us to do because we keep being known by him and he is knowing to us. When we stay close to him, we know his word. We know where to go. We, we know where not to go. So what are you choosing to believe and listen to and follow that is so embedded into our culture today? What and who are you listening to more than you are listening to God? Is it our voice we listen to or are we listening to God's? Because guess what? Our voice should not be louder than God's, y'all. Our voice should not be louder than God's. And for me, I always have this, this way of checking it. If I'm talking about my problem to other people more than I'm talking to God, that's a disconnect. We have to have discernment. We need to run to God first. Is is it the voice of the evil one? Because if we listen to that voice, it's going to doubt God's truth. We're going to doubt his word and we're going to doubt his goodness. Is it the voice of the world or our flesh? So here are five ways that we can discern in closing the voice of God. The voice of God will lead us to truth. Always. 
The voice of God will not compromise or go against his character. The voice of God does not cause confusion. The voice of God will not lead us into temptation. The voice of God will lead us into pathways of righteousness. You see, we have a danger, though, of reducing the good shepherd to a personal idol. And we can get duped into thinking that we are learning the voice of the good shepherd when actually we're just kind of turning him to our personal idol who never corrects us, who's always comfortable with our sin and our idol worship and our lifestyle. But guess what, y'all? That is contrary to the word of God. So how do we become familiar with our good shepherd? I love reading Psalms 23. It says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. So here, my friends, stay near him. Spend time with him. Converse with him. Eat from his pasture. His word. The greatest way to know the character of God is through his written word. That's how we know him. Learn to discern his voice. Learn to trust and to rest in his promises. When God is first, we are content with whatever else life brings us. Because we know that the good shepherd goes before us and is leading us. And we can gain strength and confidence when we choose to follow him. So our prayer should be, bind my wandering heart to thee. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your written word. We thank you that you didn't leave us hanging to figure this out on our own, Father. So I pray, Father God, as we are in the here and now of the struggle of living this life, amongst all the voices that are trying to influence us to Go this way, go that way. May your voice be ever so clearly to us than ever before. If we haven't heard your voice, Lord, I pray, Father God, that you would help us to learn how to discern your voice more clearly, Father God. If it's, if it's more time with you, Father God, make that known. If it's less time doing the things that have taken that place of you, make that known, Jesus. May we be people that are marked by understanding your word in a way, Father God, that we just don't read it and we don't try to recite it and memorize it, but we actually believe it and we live as if we believe that, Lord. Continue to encourage our hearts in the ways that we have not pleased you, Father. We love you, Lord. And all of that, Father God, we know that we could do nothing apart from you. We love you, Jesus. In Jesus' name.